and start my addresses with an overhead projection that has someone frowning and uh, deeply concerned uh, and hopefully by the end of our, our talk this evening uh, you still won't be frowning and deeply concerned uh, and that you have a reassurance that the things that we have believed of from our youth and certainly from the scriptures uh, are valid and will provide evidence of that. But of course uh, there is this theory of uh, theistic evolution that is currently floating around that has been a concern to a lot of brothers and sisters and young people. So we want to explain tonight, well what is this thing about theistic evolution, what does it mean, do we have to adjust our beliefs, have we got it wrong and we do have to reconfigure everything that we thought we knew was of substance. Uh, and at the outset I do want to say that the Bible doesn't oppose true science. We might have in the back of our minds this idea, well uh, Bible beliefs are old fashioned and it was ok back in the 18th and 19th century but we're living in 2014 now so how does the science synergise with the word of God or doesn't it? And of course we'll say at the beginning that true science does and we want to really define what science is all about. So our passage for this evening is, is, is a definition of science, what does theistic evolution mean? We want to look historically at uh, how the Brotherhood has already 50 years ago dealt with this particular issue and thirdly we want to have a look at some Bible quotations to reinforce that our beliefs are solid uh, and that the Bible gives us very clear guidance as to the creative hand of the Father. So true science. Of course science doesn't oppose the Bible. In many ways we know that science has been helpful in current times, particularly in the area of medicine uh, and disease. Science has been very, very helpful and perhaps as we get older we perhaps appreciate that a little bit more but certainly we're not discounting uh, many areas of science. There have been vast progression in the areas of technology, uh, in medicine as we've said, in physics, in agriculture. Uh, all these different fields have been helped by science. But of course we really need to define what science is, is all about because theistic evolution has this ring of, well it must be scientifically correct. Well true science simply is based on observation, testing and repetition. So a scientist will uh, conduct uh, an experiment, uh, they will repeat those experiments, they will propose a hypothesis and they will evaluate that and say well this is the facts as we see it at this current time. So again scientific investigators seek to understand natural phenomena by observation and experimentation. So that is the field of true science, pure science. It is limited to observation, testing and repetition. So true science does not accept a supernatural agent. Okay, so we need to be very clear on that right at the beginning. Uh, true science in its natural form only operates in the field of observation, testing and repetition. It will not allow a supernatural agent because it has to have a logical progression, an explanation and that of course then the proposal of the hypothesis. So that already eliminates God in that sense. And it's not a problem in many fields. When we look at engineering or physics or agriculture, as we look at those fields, we don't need to look at causes for, for the supernatural. So true science, uh, there's not a problem in that. It seeks to explain things from a natural viewpoint. So when we're talking about things scientific, we're not talking about biblical or spiritual things, we're just talking about observation and things from a natural viewpoint and how we, how we can explain those things. So as this comment says, even if all the data points to an intelligent designer, as we unravel uh, and as we look deeper and deeper into nature, even if the data points to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. The scientist may as an individual be free to embrace a belief in God but that's outside the restrictive field of natural observation. Okay, so we, we understand that. A scientist uh, will look at a natural viewpoint, he'll try to explain that. He might still then have a belief in God but that is separate from uh, pure science. So science uh, endeavours to show how things operate and give a logical, natural reason as to how they operate but the Bible goes a lot deeper than that in explaining the why, the reason for life, the purpose for life. Science has no interest in that, it can't explain that because it's out the outside the bounds of observation and experimentation. So the majority of scientists, that's why the majority of scientists uh, accept evolution as a process because it explains to them how things work outside of any supernatural um, intervention or involvement. 
So a scientist who has, has a scientific mind is looking for a logical explanation. The supernatural is, is removed or eradicated from that and so hence it becomes comfortable and easy to believe in this process of evolution. They have that you know, ambience, that atmosphere in which that logical progression takes place. So they would explain evolution as this. The diversity on, on, of life on Earth is the outcome of evolution. An unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable and natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification is affected by natural selection, chance, historical contingencies and changing environments. So from a scientific viewpoint, that's what they have to accept because you can't incorporate God into science at all. So it is unsupervised, it's unpredictable. So therefore, scientists accept that definition. So theistic evolution, I hope you're coming to this logical process as well, so theistic evolution in which God was involved in the process is opposed by science. So theistic evolution isn't scientific at all. all right, so we might have come along tonight thinking, well, I wonder how this is going to be dealt with because surely theistic evolution is scientific. Well, it's not because it brings into the equation God which on the basis of science, and the definition of science, cannot, cannot be allowed. So theistic evolution is not scientific. Now Richard Dawkins, of course, who is an evolutionist, said, and he quoted Darwin, for Darwin any evolution that had to be helped over the jumps by God was not evolution at all. It made nonsense of the central point of evolution. So here, here are these um, uh, men who believe in evolution who are rejecting theistic evolution. So not only in a sense is, is theistic evolution rejected by the scientists, it also is rejected by, in many cases, uh, a broad base of Christianity who believe in, in the literal creation. Theistic evolution is opposed by science and also many Christians who believe in the literacy of the Bible account of creation. It is a poor hybridisation of two diametrically opposing concepts at the beginning of life. So again, as we unravel this, we're learning that, well, it's actually not scientific at all. Now, there's a couple of uh, theories about how theistic evolution happened. We'll explore those tonight. Uh, and again, you would be aware of this, that some of the Christians that we meet take a very comfortable position. They believe their merging or hybridisation of uh, science and the Bible are joining together. Uh, and so they say, well, you know, God used evolution to create. That doesn't make any sense at all. They're saying, what they're saying is a complete contradiction. Evolutionists state that it was a random chance and therefore it eliminates God. And as we've got here, the first law of logic says that two opposite things can't be true at the same time and in the same relationship. It's either one or the other. It's either random chance or it's God's creative effort. So there's a bit of a, a paradoxical statement, isn't it, as far as theistic evolution is concerned. So proponents say that God directed evolution. Well, that can't be scientific. They take the, the view that the origins of man uh, largely on their own blind faith. There's no scientific explanation for it. I don't know of any scientist who's unravelled this and said, look, I can see the hand of God in the process of evolution. Uh, the idea of blind faith is no better than wishful thinking. It's neither scientific nor is it biblical uh, to say that God intervened trillions and trillions of times into a random process doesn't make any sense at all. Well, others say that God didn't direct the evolutionary process in any way, uh, but God was still involved in the process. They believe God guided an unguided process. How does that logically make any sense at all? God guided an unguided process. So, again, right at the beginning of our, our attempted definition of what theistic evolution is all about, we're already stumbling because... Well, it is, it's a paradoxical statement. It's a paradoxical set of belief. And the fact is, as you would know, brothers and sisters, that science is always changing and modifying, correcting, adjusting, exploring and learning. And that's accepted in the scientific field. A scientist will make a hypothesis uh, and so therefore that is an accepted uh, statement. But of course modifications can happen and as we get more and more uh, information uh, we can modify those beliefs and that's how science works and we understand that. It is, it is a moving uh, operation. So they correct and they adjust and they modify scientific facts and of course on the internet uh, there's, there's a wealth of information that we type in, you know, is coffee good for you? And uh, 
you, you, I'm not quite sure if it is or not anymore. I thought it used to be and then it wasn't. And Well, chocolate's always good. I always, you know, that's obviously a scientifically proven fact. But you look at many aspects uh, and information about these things that are constantly being modified. You know, I hate that little statement that says, research says, and then everything you thought that was good for you is suddenly bad because research says. So it's constantly being modified and changed. And interestingly, I typed in the internet is like the fastest thing in today's universe and it came up that, well, now this is being discussed because when I went to school many years ago, light was the fastest uh, thing in, in, in the universe. You couldn't go any faster than light. But now, of course, uh, there's what's called transversible warm wormholes in space. So you can go into these and they're actually faster than light. You can emerge out of a wormhole uh, and you could beat actually a beam of light. How amazing is that? So, you know, this is an illustration of where science is they're still exploring this. This is an illustration of where science is being modified and changed. So it's not just unchangeable substance. Now, you see, I didn't bring a, a set of science books. I was going to do that. We can have a set of science books here that can be out of date 20 years ago, right? Most of us who would have gone to high school would look at our high school textbooks and say, well, they're well out of date. It's all been changed. But we have in our, in our possession tonight a book that is unchanged for, from the beginning, 3,600 years. You know, we open the early books of Moses, 3,600 years old, unchanged. 2,000 years old, unchanged, definitely, the whole of it. So there's a big contrast between the Bible, which is unchanged and of substance, and we can put reliance in it, and of course science, which, which we don't have a problem with, and we understand that it's being modified and corrected and changed as more information comes on board. So I guess we do have to ask the question, which books, which set of books do we trust more? When we want to place our faith and reliance in something about where does life come from and where are we going to go, you know, this book is unchanged. It doesn't need to be modified because it is the word of God. So a belief in the Bible, brothers and sisters and young people, is not blind faith. We have evidence and there are reasons why we believe in the Bible and believe it to be substantially true. So it's not just simply a matter of blind faith. Well, we open our Bible and we just take God at his word because, well, what else can we do? It is, uh, it is tested and it is evidential faith. We know that the Bible is trustworthy. We don't need to discount the Bible. We don't need to water it down. We don't need to change it whereas, of course, science is being modified. So, in relation to that definition, I, I hope that's formed a little bit of a background so we can see clearly this, this paradoxical uh, confusion as to how can we interbreed, I guess, or join together or synergise these, these two concepts together, and it is a little bit difficult. So, science or knowledge can help us in our understanding of many fields, as we've said, it helps us to appreciate the wonders of the natural world. Science is good. It can be used in harmony with the scriptures to enhance our understanding and our appreciation of God's ways. But of course, when it comes into conflict with the Bible, then we favour the unchangeable word of God, unchangeable for 2,000 years and more. And of course, we know that the Apostle Paul had to deal with that, uh, particularly with the Corinthians, who uh, were really trying to imitate the universities of Athens and all the great philosophers of Athens and Paul dealt with that both in Corinth and he dealt with it in Athens in Acts chapter 17. There were many philosophizers uh, and Acts chapter 17 is an amazing example of how Paul dealt with the wisdom of the world. And we need to keep this firmly in our mind. This last two phrases are particularly important. Science doesn't accept the supernatural and we're okay with that. Science doesn't accept the supernatural. It will not accept miracles because it can't explain miracles. So the opening of the Red Sea uh, you know, cannot be explained. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ cannot be explained scientifically. The, the healings of the Lord Jesus Christ can't be explained. Uh, the changing of water into wine, explain that scientifically. Of course, we can't do that. So science doesn't want to get involved in the miraculous or the supernatural, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we believe to be proven by history, is outside the bounds of an explanation by science. And we're OK with that. As we've said, science focuses on natural processes only. So we do have to be careful, brothers and sisters, when we're coming to interpret the Bible, that we don't put on the glasses of a scientist and try and explain what the Bible is all about, because that won't happen. 
and this little comment here, when you use the interpretive lens of human science as the 67th book of the Bible, you're allowing scientific reasoning to demolish evidential faith because faith has no definition as far as science is concerned. It can't be defined scientifically. We know faith is something that's incredibly important. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about how critical faith is. And Paul, when he was talking and he introduced this whole subject of faith and trust in God, he says in in verse 1 through to 3, he says, to have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things that we can't see, the things that we don't understand in life, aren't there, brothers and sisters and young people? Our daily readings are taking us through Job's experiences and we get to the end of the book of Job and God says, well, where were you, Job, when I created the earth? And Job says, yeah, there are things that I just don't understand and I'm big enough to accept that God knows more than me. And Paul is exactly the same. He says, it's by faith that we understand the universe was created by God's word So what can be seen was made out of what now cannot be seen. We have trust in God's creative hand and that's uh, important for us to accept. So theistic evolution, what's it all about? Well, currently there there are a a number of strands that are uh, being promoted but it seems to be two main Christadelphian viewpoints. Uh, One is that Genesis is completely allegorical, that it's just a poem. Uh, The Genesis chapter 1 doesn't have any literal basis but it's just uh, written in poetry form and it's sort of uh, some beautiful symbols about how life may have began. You know, it's embedded in mythology. Uh, and the other one is that Adam and Eve were literally created by God as a special creation, but at the same time there are many humanoids, uh, parallel races of human beings, that had evolved at the same time. So this is probably a hard concept for us to get around because most of us had a simple faith at one stage and we thought, well, Adam and Eve created and that's how the world began. Well, well was there a, a, a group of humanoids running around the earth that had evolved for millions of years? Can we prove that or disprove that? So we want to open up um, the scriptures tonight. Uh, but historically, just for a couple of brief moments, uh, this isn't something that is new. Right back in 1965, 66, 67, a brother Ralph Lovelock back in... Watford Ecclesia in England uh, started to promote this particular theory and he believed some similar uh, aspects of what the current theories are. He believed that there was a race of humanoid creatures that existed prior to Adam. They were human in all respects but they didn't have this knowledge of God. Uh, Adam was formed from them, which is slightly different, became their representative. Uh, God gave Adam powers of leadership, longevity and truth. Adam sinned and was expelled from the garden to die, but he taught the truth to the humanoids and they became men. Uh, Adam and Eve's descendants reproduced with the humanoids. So there's lots of problems. You can see how, mm, really, how does this work out? This could be confusing. So we do want to explore that. But I just want to give you a little bit of the history and to show how balanced uh, that ecclesia dealt with, with that particular problem at the time. Uh, And so I think there was a measured approach that took a couple of years for the Ecclesia really to investigate and to come to a conclusion as to how they would deal with this theory and this brother. So there's the sort of uh, chronology of the time. Uh, Now, Brother Lovelock was quite prominent. He was on the Christadelphian Committee, the the committee for the magazine, uh, and he was also quite a prominent speaker, and people were starting to question about some of the uh, beliefs that he had. He issued some notes in April of 1965 or a little bit before that um, and now there was sort of a lot of letters and comments that were going through to the Christadelphian magazine. And Brother Sargent, who was the editor at the time, did a critique of these particular beliefs and he published that and then there were further letters of course and then the Watford Ecclesia got involved and they had to do an investigation and come to a decision as to, well, where did these beliefs stand and what would they do with this particular brother. So we want to just uh, make a couple of comments about that. Um, They made an initial statement and they said, well, can we have these two views? Is is it a problem if brothers or sisters have this sort of view that, well, there were humanoids running around as an extension of evolution? Is that a problem? Can we live with that? And they said, well, you know, if you twist the scriptures a reasonable amount, you, you probably could twist them that much to start believing in that. However, I say here, not without considerable strain of the verses immediately concerned and, without, and with destructive implications for our attitude to Bible teaching in general. 
Uh, they said the theory concerning the relationship between Adam and the antecedent and concurrent Homo sapiens race requires that our need of redemption from sin is irrespective of our descent from Adam, an idea which is irreconceivable with our understanding of the scripture because you know, if there's an integration with this race of humanoids, then we don't all come from Adam. So therefore, uh, what we understand as us inheriting sin and mortality from Adam, well, well that doesn't apply at all. So you can see how big the repercussions are in, in this particular area. Uh, Brother Ralph replied and said, well, you're living with 19th century theology. And uh, the reply was, well, maybe so, but we still have to understand exactly the solidarity of scripture. Uh, can we just jettison the clearly expressed teaching of Paul which lies at the very basis uh, of our faith? Can we accommodate, sorry, just skip that, can we accommodate uh, this race of man-like beasts or beast-like men about whom, whom the scriptures are totally silent? We don't read anything about that, do we, at all? So their response was that they didn't feel as though they could accept this particular modification to uh, the beliefs that we had uh, and you notice the highlighted area without destroying the distinctive character of our beliefs. We're satisfied that the end of such a course would be the end of us as a community because nothing could prevent a drift to the churches around us or a drift into agnosticism. So in the end we'd, we'd embed ourselves in so, many, so much scientific data we would be overwhelmed by it and eventually convince ourselves there'd be no God. We'd end up agnostics. We could therefore only recommend to the Ecclesia that Brother Lovelock's views as contained above be rejected as contrary to our common faith and understanding and, note these words, as ultimately destructive of the well-being of the brotherhood in true faith and fellowship. So, you know, there are serious repercussions for going down this pathway. Uh, in the end, they felt it would lead possibly to, to a self-destruction. So we want to you know, open up our Bible as we did Genesis chapter 1. Let's have a look at, well, what does the Bible actually say? So you notice I'm not going from the scientific aspect. I'm unqualified and it's unnecessary because we can go straight to God's word and we can use this as the testing apparatus for, well, were there sub, subhumans living at the time of Adam and Eve? Did they come as a process of evolution? So let's have a think about this. Genesis 1 verse 1, we'd be familiar with it. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we say, well, when was that? You know, what does science say? Uh, well, it doesn't matter, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter whether we have uh, a young earth or an old earth interpretation. Uh, there are some who believe, well, the earth's only 6,000 years old. There are others who say, well, no, it's, you know, billions of years old. It doesn't really matter at all to salvation. It's not fundamental. And again, we've got a couple of references there from Job and from Ecclesiastes. Uh, Job, as we've already quoted before in our talk, he says... He comments says, which doeth great things past finding out and wonders without number. There are things in the, in the capacity that God has that we will not ever understand because our minds don't operate on the same level as the, as the Father, as Isaiah says. Ecclesiastes says, he's made everything beautiful in its time and he's set eternity in the heart of man, a desire for longevity of life, yet so that man cannot find out the work that God has done from the beginning even unto the end. There are things, there are limitations that we have with our mortal frames of mind. And as well as that, what we do know though is very clearly, Psalm 33 verse 6 to 9 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. Now, a lot of times I'm going to ask you just to have a think about that verse yourself. You know, on a natural reading, when you read that verse from Psalm 33, does this suggest to you in any way that this is an evolutionary process? Just from a natural reading. He spake and it was done, he commanded, it stood fast. And again, Psalm 148 is a beautiful psalm. It says, Praise in ye heaven of heavens, ye waters that are above the heavens, let them praise the name of the Lord. He commanded and they were created. Again, how would we read that verse? We don't have to get a microscope and unpack it and unravel it and, and discover what every Hebrew word is about and find, well, it's not talking about uh, God's creative hand at all. No, the scriptures are written so that we can read them and we can understand them. We can explore them. So this is obviously evidence of God's creative hand. 
Now, the way we read Genesis 1, I think, is enlightening because you know, there's the proposal that it's a poem, it's a beautiful allegory, it's just talking about uh, some spiritual aspect. It's not really literal. So, well, let's have a think about this because verse 3 says, and God said. That dovetails, doesn't it, really, to those previous quotations. Hopefully, you know, if you want, against verse 3, you really need to have Psalm 33, 6 to 9, Psalm 148, verse 4 to 5, where it says, and God said because they're two really good cross-references uh, to put against that phrase. And I'll tell you why. Because that phrase is repeated consistently through uh, this Genesis chapter 1. So it's in verse, uh, and you might have already coloured this in, hopefully, um, verse 1, verse, sorry, verse 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, 26, 28, 29. Now, why? Why would that particular phrase be repeated so consistently uh, through Genesis chapter 1? Is it because Genesis chapter 1 is describing to us the power of the creative hand when God said and it was done or is it some sort of poem and allegory? I'm not quite sure what the poetic outcome is of these particular phrases. And not only do we have confirmation in Psalm but in Peter. Peter reaffirms it for us. New Testament 2 Peter 3 verse 5 says there are people who are willingly ignorant, they don't want to know this, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. ESV says they deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and through the water by the word of God, by the creative power of God. Does that sound to you, Old Testament, New Testament, correspondingly, some sort of process of evolution that took billions of years of random chance operations? Now, we have to answer that, I guess, for ourselves. Uh, we're looking at another phrase in Genesis chapter 1 uh, where it says, this particular phrase is, after his kind whose seed is in itself. So, you know, we, we have a look at, at verse 11. It's talking about the, the herb of the field and the trees being developed in verse 11. And it says, after his kind, whose seed it's in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So what is this verse telling us? I mean, I'm reading that verse and I'm thinking, well, it sounds to me like God created all these species to be able to reproduce perfectly because it says whose seed was in itself. There's a reason for that particular phrase. And again, as we, as we go through Genesis 1, this phrase is constantly repeating. You know, Genesis 1 is telling us something. It says, after his kind, after his kind, after his kind, after his kind. Does that sound to you like a process of random mutation? That over billions of years, through gradual change and randomness, while well, somehow all this beautiful diversity of life somehow came about? Is that, you know, as we read Genesis chapter 1, is that the natural outcome of our reading? Oh, you know, it wasn't for me. In fact, this phraseology, I believe, specifically excludes transmutation of one species into another by macroevolution. So again, the evolutionists will say, well, this is how we, we, you know, we've got whales and elephants and butterflies and spiders because they all transmutated into different species. So I think that phrase excludes that. Of course, it excludes this as well. You might, well, I'm guessing we've never seen one of these. It's a crop duck. So, of course, uh, in our observation at the zoo, uh, we've never seen this transmutation take place. It's very possible it could have happened. But not, of course, if we read Genesis chapter 1 in the way that God has composed it for our education. Now, you know, we've got an evolutionary tree here and this is particularly interesting because when we look at the evolutionary tree, you'll notice up here at the end of the evolutionary tree they have the emergence of land plants. And we didn't read the whole of Genesis chapter 1 because I presume you're familiar with it, but the first thing that emerged when land surfaced out of the water were the, the land plants. So, you know, in this process of theistic evolution, if this is to follow, well, Genesis chapter... I'm just going to get the scissors and snip that verse out because it's all out of order. In fact, you know, I need to rearrange the order of Genesis chapter 1 because it's wrong. So according to the evolution of tree, land plants and flowers were one of the last items to develop. Compare Genesis 1 verse 11, it was, well, it was on the third day according to God but not according to this uh, evolutionary process. Now you'll notice as well right down here is the emergence of fish but right up here is the emergence of birds. 
Well, they happened to occur on the same day, didn't they? When you look at verses 20, 21, 22, you'll notice it's the fish and the winged fowl on the same day, says Genesis 1, but not according to either evolution or theistic evolution. There's, there's a huge gap here. I wonder how big that gap is. Well, it's actually 30, 370 million year gap. Okay? So fish began evolving around about 530 million years ago, says uh, you know, a few people who have been dabbling into it. Birds didn't begin flying for 160 million years ago. So there's a discrepancy of 370 million years. So I'm going to tell you, don't write in your margin, this took 370 million years between the words in verse 21 of the whales and the winged fowl, halfway through verse 21. 370 million year gap. Is that how we would read Genesis 1? Could we stretch it? Could we twist it? I wouldn't think so. So these are you know, some of the problems that are starting to surface. So, uh, theistic evolution. Genesis 1 and 2 state creation took place in six days, literally. Theistic evolution would have to say, well, wait a minute, if, if evolution was happening, it can't be six days, can it? So, so those six days maybe were six periods of time. So, you know, a, a million years in between, maybe, or longer. A day doesn't have to mean 24 hours. Genesis 2 verse 4, 2 Peter 3, 8, you know, day with the Lord is a thousand years, etc, etc. Well, there's a couple of problems with that because we know this statement, the evening and the morning, is repeated. Now, when we read Genesis 1 and it says the evening and the morning, how would you naturally read that verse? Would you read that and say, well, I don't know, that could be, more, that could be a million years. Would you say that when you read the chapter? Because we're talking about a simple faith, brothers and sisters, aren't we? When we look through the characters of the Bible, you know, there weren't too many professors and scientists that God was calling to his kingdom. So it's a simple faith that is a faith that will get us to the kingdom. We, we find great comfort in that. But there is a problem when we know that it can be defined as six days. In fact, it is six days. It says Exodus 20 and verse 11 says it is. Exodus 20 verse 11 says there were six consecutive days of creation. Moses records this and he says... For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh. Genesis 2 verse 1 says, and they were finished. So, well, maybe you know, Moses didn't quite get it right. And again, I'm emphasising this, this natural reading of the word of God because this was incorporated into Israel's calendar. It came, became a barometer of their, their spiritual Debt, really, as far as the nation's operation and their respect of, the, of God was concerned. When they didn't keep the Sabbath, you know, it was, was something, it was, it was meaning that they weren't really taking a proper approach to the worship of God. So it was something that was significant as far as God was concerned. So you'd be struggling, wouldn't you, to explain Exodus 20, verse 11, I would think. You could probably twist it some way, I'm not quite sure exactly how. Well, I am actually, because theistic evolution. They turn to Deuteronomy 5 and verse 11 and 12, which doesn't have that little phrase. Uh, if you look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 11 and 12, it doesn't include that little comment about six days and the Sabbath. So, you know, what we can do is we can slip out Exodus 20, verse 11 and say, well, that was an insertion after Moses. So some would say, well, this was an insertion after Moses uh, and it is not connected with really the creative work of God. So we've got a bit of a problem, don't we? In fact, we have a really big problem. The big problem is that now if we're starting to snip verses out and say, well, we think they were insertions, it means that God's word is probably not infallible. We've always taken the inspiration of God to be absolute. But all of a sudden we're being told, well, there are some verses and stuff that, that have been inserted that really shouldn't be there. Uh, a couple of answers are obvious. Records of the same event can differ. We've got the Gospels, the four Gospels. They don't have every single event duplicated through those Gospels, do they? So just because there's, there's not a, another verse that is a perfect reproduction of a, another verse in, in Scripture doesn't uh, discount that at all. Uh, Deuteronomy is not an escape clause because, as I've said, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So we've got two, two options really, don't we, with, as far as Deuteronomy 5 is concerned. Either, well, Exodus by extension, either a scribe did not make it under inspiration, then the inspiration of the scriptures are challenged, 
And even when you look at the context of Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 says, and God spake all these words. So if you're going to say that verse has to come out of Exodus 20, you've got a big problem with the inspiration of Scripture. Or, secondly, a scribe did make this insertion. Let's say he made the insertion. Under inspiration, it's still Scripture and it's correct and it stands. In fact, if it was inserted by a later scribe, wouldn't it strengthen the matter if it was already not obvious? So, you know, we have those options when we, when we look at that particular proposal. Additionally, and there's another layer to this, Exodus 31 verse 17 actually reiterates this command. It teaches that God created life in six days. Uh, there it says, It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the seventh day rested and he was refreshed. So you know that, that word for days is the Hebrew word yom. Uh, and it can mean different time periods, but generally in the context, the context is the way the word has to be interpreted. And of course you all know the word Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. What does it mean? The day of atonement. It's a 24 hour period. So that's where that Hebrew word is used. So again, that can be, uh, that can be helpful. So if Exodus is the inspired word of God, theistic evolution is false. If theistic evolution is true, then these verses are false and the inspiration of scripture is therefore not true. So that's where we're sort of heading, aren't we, as far as this logic is concerned. Now here's another little uh, aspect that we need to have a think about. When God created the earth, he stepped back and he looked at it and he said, it's all very good, didn't he? God saw everything that he'd made and behold, it was very good. Now this is repeated in verse 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25. This is an important point because we need to think, well, wait a minute, if the theory of... Uh, evolution is, con- is true, then there's, there's a lot of not very good stuff going on behind the scenes as, as the processes are evolving. Theistic evolution have millions of years disease, sickness, carnivorous behaviour and death. It's part of the process. How did you know, this evolutionary process cons- you know, continue to develop? Well, it, well, it needed uh, six species to die off so that the superior, the survival of the species could move forward. It needed that, it was beneficial. So in what sense could God look at the earth in a very continuous upheaval because if there was still this subhuman race that was still sort of developing and animals were still developing, how could he step back and say, well, this is all very good? In fact, notably, humans are never described in this way after the fall. Now, this is a critical point. So God looks at this, his creation and he sees the environment and he steps back and he thinks that's very good. So very good means no evil, no sickness, no car- car- carnivores, no struggle for existence, no survival of the fittest, no death, doesn't it? Isn't that what that phrase means? I mean, how, how are we going to twist this phrase and say, well, I know God said it looks very good, but evolution was still happening, survival of the fittest was still happening. D- does that make any sense? It didn't to me. Uh, Genealogies. Why are there no genealogies that go before Adam? It's significant, isn't it? Again, as we approach the scripture, that Adam is always, uh, the the connection only goes back to Adam. Genesis 5, Luke 3, Jude 14, verse 14, 1 Chronicles 1. And the point is this. If you've got Adam and Eve, and there's this um, family from Adam and Eve, but you've got these subhumanoids Uh, that are existing as well, and they came into the truth, then their genealogy goes back to, well, I don't know, I'm I'm not going to say Mr Monkey, but, um, you know, their genealogy goes back on a different length. But all the genealogies only ever go back to Adam. Why is that? Because if Cain married some other woman of a human species, wouldn't there be somewhere people that have come into the truth that have a different genealogy? So that's a question we need to ask as well. A little interesting statement, Genesis 2 verse 18. How do we read this? God looked at his creation, an Adam, and he said it's not good that man should be alone. Really? Didn't God know that there were millions of uh, humanoids running around the jungle uh, just outside the Garden of Eden? Well, how do we read that verse? Does that mean, now, now theistic evolution, of course, going to do a bit of uh, gymnastics here, scriptural di- gymnastics. Well, it's talking about Adam in the garden. He was alone in the garden. That's what the verse says. Well, how do we explain that? 
Well, Genesis 2 and verse 5 says, and this is the context of it, there was not a man to till the ground. So outside the garden, uh, there was not a man to till the ground. Weren't there millions of humans working, working the earth, digging caves, cave painting? Not sure what they did. <laughs> um, additionally, and wonderfully, in the New Testament, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Adam is called the first man Adam. I wonder what, how Paul understood creation. Did Apostle Paul have it wrong? Uh, Eve is called the mother of all living. Now that phrase cannot be right. We're going to have to do a lot of uh, snipping of verses and crossing out of lines because, well, Eve wasn't actually the mother of all living because there was a whole race, a huge race of humanoids. Uh, Eve was not the, the mother of all living at all. So, can you see how as we start to read certain verses it doesn't make any sense from Scripture? In the New Testament, again, we've looked at the Old Testament, let's just jump across the New Testament for a little bit. Paul confirms it in Acts 17 verse 36. He says, and he's made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Okay, so our origins come from one. Uh, well, a theistic evolutionist will say oh, that's referring to Noah. Because uh, remember there was a flood, so it comes from Noah. Of course, we, we can't get too involved in whether there was a local or a, a global flood, but, well, maybe Paul was referring to, to Christ, the work of Christ, the blood of Christ. Well, the ESV says, the, and puts it a bit clearer, the God, who, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything, and he made... From one man, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. I don't know how you could read that verse any other way. I mean, to me, Paul, as he stands in Athens, university city, he's contending with the philosophers of his time, he says, from one man, every nation was made to dwell on the face of the earth. How would you understand that phrase? <coughs> and I think we read it in the right way. I think we do understand it correctly. In our simple faith that interconnects both Old Testament and New Testament with the logical, creative hand of God, we read it in the, in the correct way. So you're going to have to twist all these verses incredibly to, to try and prop up uh, this aspect of theistic evolution. Well, humanoids, they just, well, who did Cain marry? You know, this is one of the little comments that is made. Well, obviously there was another race of people because, well, who did Cain marry? And, and you know... Theistic evolutionists point to a number of problems in the verse. Uh, here in, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 14 it says, you know, I'm afraid that everyone that sees me will, will want to kill me. And this is obviously referring to all the humanoids outside the garden and, uh, you know, they're wanting, wanting to kill me. He went to, to the land of Nod, they say, obviously, you know, it's a place that's inhabited by other people and, of course, verse 17 says he married a wife and the comment is, is it more moral to accept incest rather than the possibility of evolution? So, you know, a few proposals there. Well, who did Cain marry? I guess a bit of an interesting question. And if we just go over to Genesis 5 and verse 4, uh, you'll note that it says, verse 4, after the days, and the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800, 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. See that little phrase? And he begat sons and daughters. So he lived for 930 years, take off 800. Um, so we've got 130 years, right, before he begat Seth, and then sons and daughters. So, well, there was no one for Cain, was there? So goes the argument. So how would we explain that, I wonder? Well, of course, every generation begins with important people. And again, we would be aware that some generations skip over insignificant people. But anyway, every generation begins with a son. Daughters are not generally mentioned in genealogies. Obviously, Adam had, could have had numerous daughters. Uh, a further point is that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born. He was told in chapter 1 and verse 28 to be fruitful and multiply. Did he really only have three sons in 130 years? So you know, it doesn't quite sound as though he's fulfilling the command of God if there are only three sons in 130 years. So you see, there is a significance to Seth at the 130 year point, but that doesn't preclude Adam and Eve having numerous children before. Seth particularly fulfilled the position of Abel. 
Uh, why would human would care about Adam's family and want to kill Cain? Why, why wouldn't they? Wouldn't they welcome him? I mean, survival of the fittest. He destroyed um, Abel. So wouldn't that put him up on the evolutionary uh, scale as survival of the fittest? He knows how to do it. Why would they want to... Why would they have an interest in, in destroying Cain at all? And the fourth point is, of five, uh, God defines morality. Incest was only illegal under the law of Moses. Remember, Adam, uh, sorry, Abraham married his half-sister, Amram married his aunt. Subsequently became illegal in, in Leviticus 18. There was a law put in place by Moses. And, of course, the fifth point is the gene pool, of course, would be diverse and pure, uh, so he could have married someone younger who he didn't grow up with. And, again, over the course of, we don't know Eve's age, but over the course of 900 years family could be quite extensive. I mean, in theory, I guess you could have had 850 kids, which you know, seems a lot, but I guess in those times you had to keep yourself occupied for a thousand years or so. <laughs> so anyway, you know, Cain could have married someone who was 50, 60, 70 years younger than him uh, out of a, a, a large family. So uh, as far as the atonement is concerned, of course, this is starting to stream into well, how do we deal with the atonement, our connection to Adam. Theistic evolution requires mortality, right? When you think about it, uh, if there is a, a race of subhumans running around who have been living and dying for millions of years, then mortality isn't anything new on the earth, is it? It's already been in place there for a long, long time. Uh, the teaching of the scriptures is that death mortality came by sin after the fall. So, you see, if you're going to embrace theistic evolution, you basically have to shred your Bible. Because if mortality was in place, then what the, both the Old Testament and particularly the New Testament writers were talking about makes no sense at all. So let's explore this. Uh, theistic evolution says that death didn't come into the world when Adam sinned. It was already there. Well, we know Adam was not immortal. We know he was not immortal. Uh, in order for death to be a punishment, which is what it was in chapter 2 and verse 17, he was not mortal therefore either, otherwise it doesn't make any sense, does it? If Adam was mortal and going to die, and God said, well, if you sin, you'll die, Adam would have shrugged his shoulders and said, well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything to me. Adam disobeyed God and death mortality was the consequence. Romans 5 verse 12, Romans 6 verse 23, we'll explore them a little bit. Uh, regardless of what we might think of animal mortality, you know, they may have been dying, um, all humanity inherits death from Adam, not from previous humanoid ancestors. Okay, so we're going to have to shuffle, if we take this line of theistic evolution, we're going to have to shuffle major points of the atonement. So you see, I'm only coming this from a, a scriptural viewpoint tonight, not scientific. So let's jump across to the New Te Testament and here's some very powerful quotes. Romans 5, verse 12 and 14. Did, what did Paul understand about creation? What did he believe? He's inspired. He wrote with the pen of God. He said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, and so death passed on all men for all sin, and death reigned from Adam and Moses. So what does that verse from a natural reading tell you? How do we understand? I think it confirms to how we've all, always understood the process of the atonement, sin and mortality. But you're going to have to do major, major shifting and shredding of this verse to, to try and fit it with theistic evolution, which says, no, Paul, you're wrong. Uh, it, there wasn't just one man on the earth. There were many men on the earth, uh, and they were all dying creatures anyway. So, you know, there's, there's uh, some major difference there. Well, they try and get around it by saying, well, yeah, death didn't just mean death. It meant maybe a special death, a violent death or eternal death where there was no hope of resurrection, a moral death. Maybe it means a spiritual death. Um, you know, you can juggle all these terms all you like, but on, when we read Paul's word and we follow the logic of it, we understand exactly what Paul was saying. Death was a consequence of sin and mortality, we inherit mortality because of Adam's a consequence to, to Adam's decision. So, one man governs every cause, clause. By this one man, sin entered the world. Through this one man came death, says Paul. Through this one man, death passed on all. Because of the sin of this one man, all have sinned. Death entered the world from Adam. I mean, you couldn't be clearer. I mean, Paul's you know, just emphasising this point to show how the creative activity of God suffered the consequence of the decision of Adam. 
It's reaffirmed in verse 17. If we had the time, we could look at Romans 5 and unpack it. It's very powerful. In a simple way, when we join it together, Genesis, we know the record says that God warned Adam that sin would bring death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin are death. We, We understand that. Adam sinned. One man, Adam, sinned. Adam sinned, introduced death. Genesis 1, sinless man died to provide life. That parallel between Genesis and Romans makes no sense if there was a world where millions of humans or subhumans or humanoids were going through that process of dying. It doesn't make any sense at all. Add to that. So you see, there's overwhelming evidence, I think. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man came death, by man came the resurrection of the dead, for as as in Adam all die, even so in Christ will all be made alive. Now Paul has a very clear understanding of creation. He says, by man came death. Wrong, Paul. No, no. Paul, you got it all wrong. Because in 2014 we discovered that there was probably subhumans running around. And so you didn't quite get it right. Really? Uh, And Paul is drawing a beautiful parallel between uh, the work of... Christ uh, restoring again uh, that hope of life. It says, by Adam came death. He was not mortal before the transgression. Because of Adam's sin all die. There are no exceptions. Death and mortality are part of our present constitution because of Adam's sin, not because of millions of years of evolution. See, there's substantial change that has to happen <coughs> with Scripture. You've got to tear a lot of pages out, including the New Testament, uh, if you're going to go down the path of theistic evolution. Not enough. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was given a living soul. How do you read that? You know. uh, theistic evolution says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Uh, Adam can't be the first man because Christ is called the second man in verse 47. Called the second man, referring to Christ. So Adam was the first man that had a relationship with God uh, and that's why he's called the first man. Uh, But Christ is not the last man that God has had a relationship with. So where it says the last man referring to Christ, uh, obviously the relationship didn't stop at the Lord Jesus Christ, it's continued through to us. What it's pointing out is Adam and Christ are unique in scripture being two descendants of God. Adam, the son of God, remember in the New Testament that chronology, Christ, obviously, the Son of God. No other men affect the destiny of humanity as these two men did. First man, second man, significant because they're representatives of death and life. Adam, the problem, Christ, the solution. That's why Paul is writing like that in 1 Corinthians 15. Do you think he had in the back of his mind, I wonder how I'm going to explain about humanoids? No. Again, you're going to have to do some serious snipping to those, that chapter and those verses if you go down the pathway of theistic evolution. So therefore, you know, when we come to our statement of faith, uh, our statement of faith is very connected with our understanding of the scripture. It says the first man, Adam, uh, he was made very good in kind and condition. Okay, so it's not that Adam was mortal at all. Uh, Our statement of faith, Birmingham went to statement of faith, said in kind and condition. So it doesn't talk about other subhuman species that that already had mortality in place. And it particularly defines that man was made very good, not a mortal state. Clause 5 goes on. Sorry to bore you with technicalities, but I just want to sort of nail this pretty well. Uh, It says, Adam broke the law, was was a judge unworthy of immortality, sentenced to return to the ground, a sentence which defiled and became a physical law in his being. He inherited mortality. That's essentially what he's saying. That's how we read the scriptures, isn't it? Simple reading. It's confirmed for us in our statement of faith. We've also got a doctrine to be rejected in relation to evolution. Add on top of that, of course, our uh, our unity agreement here in Australia, Cooper Carter Addendum. You'd all know that off by heart. (laughs) So this was uh, sort of, again, part of that healing process of fellowship and it was reconfirmed in how we understand the scriptures. Adam was declared to be very good and because of his disobedience he was sent to return to the dust. He inherited therefore a defiled conscience and mortality and his descendants, as his descendants, we partake of that mortality that came by sin. Very clear. So, you know, we've got the scripture, we've got our constitution, 
We've got the unity agreement. They're all confirming our understanding of the scripture. I'm going to uh, skip over all these questions uh, and just do a summary. So in summary, brothers and sisters, Pope hasn't been sort of overwhelming with all that information, but there's some very powerful scriptural quotes that completely, uh, completely tend to disarray this, this theory of theistic evolution. So the, theistic evolution is scientifically and doctrinally wrong. Theistic evolution challenges the Bible, our statement of faith in the Australian Unity Agreement. So it is pretty serious. And the encouragement is to you to keep your evidential faith, faith based on evidence. It's not blind faith. We don't just take the Bible and we'll just say, well, whatever this book says we believe. We've investigated it. We've come to a point where we have our faith in our God that what he writes is absolute. Keep it simple and keep it strong. The Bible is full of individuals who did. They'll be in the kingdom. As Paul says in Hebrews 13, they died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And may the God of creation send his son shortly to this earth, brothers and sisters, that we might witness a new creative power. And it won't take billions of years to change us. Paul says very beautifully, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be enhanced with immortality. And that truly will be the evidence of the miracle of the vast creative power of the God that we've come to love.